Hello and uh, welcome to our first video for Year 10 History um, in our Rights and Freedoms Unit. Uh, so this lesson will highlight the major events of the 20th century after the end of World War II until about today. Um, let's get started. Thanks for watching. Right, before we, we begin, um, I'll just highlight uh, you know what you're going to hopefully get out of this little session. Uh, so by the end of it, um, you will know uh, the main events since World War II. Now there's obviously 70 years uh, since the end of World War II, uh, so there's a, a lot of things happening in that time. Uh, this is just some of the key ones uh, relevant to our unit. Uh, you'll understand how these events that I've selected um, have contributed to the development of the 20th century, um, and of course, you know where we are today in the start of the 21st century. Um, as you do this, don't forget take a pen and paper um, and make some uh, notes. Um, I've shown you in the other video how to do that. Um, you know, and ask some questions. Um, you know, what can you ask to get a deeper understanding? Okay, so last term we looked at World War II and what caused it and what happened during it. Um, so now we're going to start looking at you know what happened afterwards um, and in the 70 years after that in terms of um, you know rights and freedoms uh, that we have today. Um, so it's important to recognise that World War II. Uh, witnessed levels of human suffering uh, that are quite frankly nearly impossible for us to really comprehend. Um, in Europe, um, you know, besides the war itself, um, you know, we had the Holocaust. You know, Germany surrendered um, on May 8, uh, 1945, uh, marking what's called the VE Day or Victory in Europe. Um, in the Pacific, uh, you know, the atomic bombs dropped by America on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, resulted in you know, what's called VJ Day uh, on 14th of August 1945, which uh, saw J Japan surrendering um, and that victory over Japan. Uh, but it's important to recognise that um, in all of that, uh, there's approximately 70 million people that died um, in those years, uh, 23 million of them civilians. Uh, the Holocaust alone in Europe uh, cost 6 million Jews their lives, um, and in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, 150,000 and 75,000 uh, people respectively uh, in each of those cities. So that level of suffering was then uh, you know, sort of witnessed around the world um, and the media um, spread that, that the news of that devastation. So established in 1945 as a reaction to what the world saw as human rights violations between the Holocaust um, the Pacific bombings, and then just the war in general. Uh, the UN was established to make sure that the evils of World War II were not repeated. The aim of the United Nations is uh, for countries to work together towards peace and development and to create opportunities for countries to settle disputes diplomatically and not through war and conflict. Uh, so the UN's played quite a significant part in the development of modern human rights with the release of the Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights. We'll explore that at a later date. Um, in the meantime, let's have a look at some of those key events that the UN has had to face um, since World War II. The first one being the Cold War. Okay, so for almost half a century after World War II, the world was affected by the Cold War. Now it was called the Cold War because of the lack of actual face-to-face -face conflict and fighting. Uh, the Cold War was not about temperature, first dad jack of the year, all right? Um, but was a war of ideas and threats, um, information and secrets, technology um, and spies. Um, it was a race to get the bigger, the better weapons. All right. So most countries took sides, um, either voluntarily or forcibly aligning with either the communist Soviet Union, um, or the, which is now Russia, um, or the capitalist United States, which is now still America. Um, this map shows how the world was divided during the Cold War. So the countries in blue were aligned with the United States of America and were grouped under the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or NATO, uh, while the countries in red were allied with the Soviet Union or back then um, it was known as the USSR, uh, which were grouped under the Warsaw Pact, which was a group of eight allied communist countries. Interestingly, you'll see that in a lot of the blue countries there are red dots, and in some of the red countries, there are blue dots. So those are countries that are predominantly aligned to one of those two sides. But within that are small groups of resistance fighters uh, called guerrillas. And that 
is the uh, catalyst for conflict um, with um, the Cold War. Um, the Cold War was uh, an era of uncertainty and fear, a lot of uh, threats, and um, uh, overall that was the fear of an atomic war um, that could wipe out the world. Um, fortunately, it didn't. And we're still here. So one of the main points of non-violent conflict between the Americans and the Russians uh, was the race to the moon, the price, bragging rights, right? and all the perks of national pride that came with, hey, I'm the first guy on the moon. Um, the Russians were the first to actually put a spaceship um, in space um, with Sputnik in 1957. Um, 1961, Russia still leading the way with Yuri Gagarin, uh, was the first man in, in actual space. Um, it wasn't until 1969 with the famous moon landing and Neil Armstrong that America um, won the space race, uh, won the race to the moon. So what countries didn't officially fight over the Cold War? Um, other countries and allies um, of those Cold War countries uh, were affected by tensions between the, the, the main parties. Um, resulting in little wars here and there. So one of them, for example, was the Korean War. So when communist North Korea um, invaded South Korea in 1950, allies of South Korea came to its support and resulted in a truce um, by 1953. Um, tensions are still very high between these two countries. If you look on the news, North Korea, South Korea, um, there's always some sort of tension there um, between them. The Vietnam War was another um, uh, significant war in this period between communist North Vietnam, uh, which was backed by Russia um, and China, and the anti-communist South Vietnam, uh, which was supported by the USA, South Korea and Australia. And this was a very political war. We'll cover this in detail later on in the unit. Um, it still causes a lot of heated debates um, today. Um, and it was also the first war that America lost, um, which you know, was a big blow to the morale um, of the time of especially capitalist uh, Western countries. Now, the Cold War officially ended in 1991 when the USSR um, was dissolved into 15 different countries, except for Russia, which is still a very big country. Um, however, it was the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, so a couple of years before, that symbolized the end of that Cold War tensions um, around the world. Um, but also, more importantly, the end of communism in, in Central and Main Europe. Um, so built in 1961, uh, the wall had divided the capital of Germany between the communist East Berlin and the capitalist West Berlin. It had been a symbol of division, not just politically, but socially and economically for over 30 years. So the end of the Cold War did not unfortunately end conflict. In the last 20 or so years, the world has still seen war, genocide, terrorism, and acts against humanity. Now, most notably for us for this unit um, is Rwanda, the Balkans, and the Middle East, um, all of which have seen um, significant amounts of you know, disaster, um, acts against humanity, and UN involvement to limited effect. Now, this attack on September 11, 2001, shocked the world and had profound effects on global markets, society and cultures, um, and ushered in a new age that President Bush um, dubbed as the War on Terror. We are still fighting this war today, uh, and there's no side and end. But hold on, it's not all doom and gloom. It's not just about war. In this, whole, in this time, the world's population has been increasing. Between 1950 and 2014, the population has increased from about 2.5 billion people to over 7 billion. And while this creates issues you know, with food and water and, and, and living space, uh, this positive growth is due to the development in health and well-being um, you know, supported by the UN that has allowed for higher birth rates and lower death rates. So a combination of healthcare, cleaner conditions and technology has helped to keep people alive for longer and happier. In 1900, a person was expected to live on average to 31 years. In 2013, that average lifespan was 71. In 100 years, 
people are living over twice as long. So in the last 30 years, levels of technology have increased faster and further than ever before. So communication, travel, medicine, the building industries, entertainment, lifestyle, uh, everything <laughs> has made the world faster, more connected, and far easier to access than ever before. Like this flip video. Enjoy. Now this period in time has also seen uh, big movements um, in stuff like environmental awareness. So you know, what most indigenous cultures um, could have told European explorers hundreds of years ago is that humans and the environment live on a delicate balance. Um, it's been it, it's been in this last 70 years that the Western world has begun to actively protect and sustain the world we live in. So this image, for example, was taken in 1982 and shows protesters blocking a road to the Franklin Dam site in Tasmania. Now, this was one of the most successful environment protests in Australian history. Um, yeah. So more recently, the debate over global warming and the impact of humans on the environment has become very heated. <laughs> That's no pun. Arguably, rising temperatures are resulting in polar ice caps melting and sea levels rising, as well as sea temperatures um, rising. Um, and this has resulted in stronger, more frequent and deadlier weathers from floods and storms to droughts around the, the whole globe. Um, the argument between you know, sort of fossil fuels and renewable energy um, is a very, very, very um, strong one uh, with um, a lot of conflict on both sides. Okay, the 19th century or the 1800s was tagged as the British century. The 20th century or the 1900s was dubbed as the American century. The 21st century or the um, 2000s uh, is quickly being recognized as the Asian century. In the past 30 years, China and India have quickly become the most populated countries in the world, but also hold huge impact on global, econo global economy and markets through their ability to make, export and sell products to the, to the world. It's estimated that by 2025, Asia will produce over 50% of the world's products. Okay, and there's lots and lots and lots more of events that have happened in the last 70 years that, that would be great to discuss. But we just don't have the time now. Okay, so that's the end of our session. Um, hopefully by now you've, um, you know, know of a selection of main events um, since World War II. And more importantly, you understand how those events have contributed to the development of the 20th century. Hopefully you've taken some notes on your uh, paper or on your computer um, of this video. Um, and more importantly, you're gonna ask some questions. Hopefully you can bring them to class when we next meet. Thanks for listening, thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.